them wisdom with understanding the decisions that need to be made at that conference. And I pray for traveling mercies. Um, I don't know. Um, are we on Facebook tonight? Oh, okay. Greetings to those on Facebook. <laughs> Welcome to For His Glory Christian Assembly. Um, before I came in tonight, there was a commercial on TV. I don't know if anybody saw it. It was kind of struck me. There was young people all mulling around different places, going in and out of places, and they all had bushel baskets on their head. I was waiting for the apples, you know, waiting for the... And the song that was singing was Let Your Light, uh, This Little Light of Mine. Have you seen that commercial? Well, apparently... Um, is tomorrow the 5th or today? Tomorrow's the 5th, right? <laughs> I haven't been to work today. I was praying. So um, tomorrow, it's bring your Bible to school day. That's what the commercial was about. I don't know. You know, I'm not promoting the commercial or, or the, I don't know um, if you want to go online and look it up and see what that's all about, if that's something, you know, but I just thought that was interesting. It was playing the song, This Little Light of Mine, Let Your Light Shine. And um, I thought, praise God in this world we live in. Uh, the message that God has given me tonight, you know, when God puts things on your heart, he usually births them from something that you've been praying or he puts the, the burden in your, head, in your heart for something. And Monday night prayer, um, there was a real strong burden on my heart. And that burden was for the, our children, the children of the believers that are backslidden or not living for God or, or just cold to the gospel. They don't want God. And as a parent living for God and raising your children the best you can, there is no perfect person in this place, um, our whole desire is for God, our children, to want God. We can't put that in them. We can only teach them who he is. So the burden on my heart and the word and the, and the cry of my heart was for our wicked, that sounds harsh, I know, um, the, the wicked heart, the unbelieving heart, the wicked, unbelieving heart for our, that our children have and for the lost. And so I cried that out to God, and, um, and he hears us. He heard that cry. Okay, so I just want to encourage any parents here tonight. When, um, when I was going through some trials, which continue with my family and my children, my heart was broken. And I remember coming to this altar. It was actually the other church and crying out to God, and crying out my grief to him, and, and telling him I was so ashamed. I was ashamed, the shame of the sin that my children were committing against God was, was enormous, and it was an enormous weight to carry. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, it's not your shame to bear. I took that upon the cross it's it's already been dealt with so the atonement has been paid repentance and forgiveness should come when when our children choose okay so that was part of my week <laughs> so i'd like to turn to the psalm of david tonight psalm 19 We're going to talk about the heart. Sorry, I should put a marker in my Bible. I didn't. Psalm 19. I'm going to read through it, the whole thing, and then we'll stop and talk about it. First of all, we all know the significance of our physical heart. Our physical heart is a muscle 
that pumps the blood and supplies the blood to all our body, carries the oxygen, and the life is in the blood. Praise God. So when Jesus, when God, talks about our hearts, our hearts, our hearts are the life source. They, 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 they give us life. They promote that, that flow of the blood, the flow of the spirit through our bodies. When God's talking about our heart, he's talking about our spiritual lives, our spiritual heart for him. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto evening uttered speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voices is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as the strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat of thereof. God's creation is magnificent. It screams of him. The law of the Lord is perfect, con converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Moreover, to be desired are they than gold, yea, much fine gold, sweeter than also, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let not let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. And here's my key verse tonight. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in, the sight of, in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We all know this says to the chief musician, a psalm of David. We all know David. We've heard many, many stories of David. A man after God's own heart. A man who made many wrong choices in his life. But every time he made a wrong choice and he failed, he accepted, he accepted the discipline and he repented before God. So he was restored. So we do not have to be overwhelmed by our failures because we have a God we can go to who is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Looking back, the first half of the psalm declares how creation shows God's glory. From there, the writer transitions to, to the law and the statutes of God how pure it is, enlightening the eyes. The statutes, the statute of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening to the eyes. The um, verse 8, when it says, Where you, um, the statue of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. I want you to remember the heart, our attitude, our life, our, our devotion, our spirit towards God. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, Matthew says in, verse six, um, in chapter 6, verse 21. Earthly mindedness, are you earthly minded or heavenly minded? The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening to the eyes. And in Matthew six twenty-two through 24, 
Can we go there for one minute? Sorry, honey. Matthew 6, 22 through 24. The light of the body is in the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. And next verse. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light is in thee, be if the light in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And I think it's important for you to know tonight that the the scripture and the um, the message that I have is not one of condemnation or um, to overwhelm anybody. It's God's mercy on us as believers. God wants us to examine ourselves, to continue in the faith, because if we want to intercede for our families and our loved ones, we need to have a right spirit. We need to have a right heart. So this is the love of God tonight that I share with you. In verse 9 of Psalm 19, it says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, and the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and honeycomb. Moreover, is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. So God's word is, is so wonderful. He gives us his word. He warns us through his word. He keeps us through his word. And when we're faithful to the end, there is a reward. So again, where I had read, I didn't turn there with you, but in Matthew 6, 21, when it talks about where your treasure is, there will help you also. It says that um, to be earth, earthly, you know, to be heavenly minded, and there is great reward when you serve God to the end. David speaks in verses 12 and 13, how only God understands his, his errors, not God's errors, our errors, <laughs> David's errors, and he, he can clean us from, um, sorry, secret faults. He asks God for help over his presumptuous sins. And finally, the last verse, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord my strength, and my redeemer. That's where we need to be. When you cry out to God, do you, do, is your heart acceptable in his sight? Do you, you know, are you right with God? Here in this verse, we see the words of my mouth. And if you remember, the mouth is the inside the mouth is the tongue the most unruly member and unless your tongue is submitted to God your mouth and the words of your mouth will not be acceptable unto him in the second part it says um, meditation of my heart and again the heart the unregenerated heart the unsaved heart the heart is deceitfully wicked, and who can know it? So that's our natural heart. Meditation. Meditation is a place of worship or prayer that we shut ourselves and we shut out all the noise and distractions of this world. We focus our attention on, us, on the scripture that God has given us and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate this word in us. Meditation is a very important part of, of spending time with God, of learning of him. But it's not like the world meditates. It's not, it's not opening your mind or making your mind blank and allowing any thought to come from any source. Meditation is a form or a part of prayer, a part of being closer with God, 
pot of pressing in with him. But you need to remember your, when, you, when God gives you word, you need to meditate on the word. Meditate on the life, you know, that comes from the word of God. And then you will, he will illuminate it. He will make you stronger. And your heart will be well. Bible says pray without ceasing in in your word I meditate day and night said Psalm 1 1 through 3 David just declared in the psalm God's greatness his glory the purity and power of God's word the righteousness of his word how precious and valuable it is more than gold sweeter than honey if you remember in Ezekiel, when God gave him the command to speak, he first gave him the scroll, and he said, eat this. And when Ezekiel ate that scroll with the word of God, it was like sweet honeycomb. He exclaimed how sweet the word of God was. He even points out how by the word of God we are warned, thus protected, and in obedience is great reward, verse 11. And David, most of us look in, looks, I'm sorry, then David, like most of us, looks into himself. He sees the weakness, the sinful heart, the sins of omission and commission, even those we fail to admit, the sins we cover over, rationalize, or are too proud to see. David understands his own strength and desires that he cannot overcome. And he, um, and he is asking God to help him that sin will not have dominion in his life. This Psalm 19 is a prayer, a prayer from the heart that we can all in our quiet time, spend time with God. If you pray this prayer and meditate on this word, God will do work in you. Only by the hand of God, in this case, the word, there is power in the living word. Um, sorry, there is power in the word, living word of God, to be innocent and upright from great transgression. In Psalm 119.11, not happy. <laughs> Psalm 119.11. Sorry. <laughs> Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. With my lips, I'm sorry, 12, bless thee. Bless art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. And then again in 13, with my lips have I declared all thy judgments of thy mouth. 14 says, have rejoiced in thy way, thy testimonies, as much as in all riches. And 15, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. 16, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. This, this portion of Psalm 119 is almost identical to 19. It's talking of the word. It's talking of his heart. It's talking of his lips, declaring the judgments of God. And it's talking about meditating in the precepts and having respect unto thy ways. We'll notice the similarities. The word, my heart, my lips, my mouth, thy word. Meditate. Meditate is an action, but it's one that requires you to be still. You have to be still. You have to find that quiet place. I know we read, we come to church, we hear a message every week. We hear messages two, three times a week. We listen to messages on the radio. 
listen to messages on TV. It's overload. And that's okay, but that's not, that's not what we need to be doing. We need to hear the word, and we need to meditate on it. So when we come to service on Sunday, we need to hear that message again on Monday in our quiet time. We need to hear the word again. God, you spoke to me yesterday. I just want to, like, hear you again. You know, I want to spend time with you. I want to hear that word again. Let that word take root in my life. Bring forth good fruit, Lord. So we need to meditate. Part of our prayer life, part of our walk with God, read the word, you hear that all the time. Spend time in prayer. Prayer is a dialogue, as Pastor Bob says, not just, not just speaking but listening. Meditation is part of that quiet time. I'm sorry, I lost my place. I'll be right with you. As we, as we know the association between sin and spiritual death, we also know salvation and deliverance only come through faith in Jesus Christ and the application of his atonement for our sins by repentance and being born again. As Christians, we live daily, and though we don't live in sin, we live daily, we have temptations and opportunities to sin every day. Some obvious choices, sometimes not so obvious attitudes, thoughts, or conversations. Sometimes we sin against God, and we're not even, you know, it's not a blatantly doing it on, you know, in rebellion. But then later you say, boy, I shouldn't have said that. Or I shouldn't have done that. Or I shouldn't have thought that. Conviction comes, thank God. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In Proverbs 31, the speaker is saying to her son, Attend to my words. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. Again, what we do, the time we spend in the word, it's life to our heart, to our spirit. Getting back to my prayer for my children, the, the word wicked, wicked, unbelieving heart, and the guilt or the sadness that I felt with that word wicked, because wicked is an awful word. It's an awful, you know, that's what the Bible calls it, wicked, unbelieving. And I, I didn't want that on my children, but I needed to pray what the Spirit of God was putting on me. So in Hebrews 3, verse 12, if we can turn there, please. Hebrews 3, verse 12. Prior to this, talked about Moses and those that were traveling with him of the house of Moses. They were going through the wilderness time. And there was a whole generation that was lost. They died before they got to the promised land. And it says in 3.12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you, any of you, an evil heart of unbelief, in departing from living God. God is warning us. God is giving us who know him a moment tonight to check our hearts, to make sure that we are in the faith, to make sure that we are meditating on his word and can hear him because we have the power with God to make intercession for those that might be lost. 
without him. So this is not a message of sadness or hard, hard message. This is a, heart, a message of love, again, encouraging us to check our hearts. Wicked, in, wicked unbelieving heart in departing from the living God. People with Moses who hardened their heart from sin fell away, not entering into God's rest, it says, not knowing his ways. Ezekiel 36, verse 21 through 27. Let's take a heart. Um, God tells Ezekiel that he's going to take the heart of stone and give him a heart of flesh. Praise God, I want a heart of flesh. I want a heart that is pliable in God's hands. So all this talk about the heart and about meditation and having a heart after God, I was moved to the parable of the sower. Remember the parable of the sower. It's in three Gospels. It's in, um, it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it was, it was a, a parable that Jesus spoke. And he spoke in parables because he wanted those that have ears to hear to hear him. But those who, who, who were not, they had hardness of heart, they weren't going to hear, they weren't going to understand the parable. Solomon, when Solomon, you know, the wisest man in the world, <laughs> he asked God for a heart of understanding to judge between good and evil. So, um, we need that kind of heart. We need a heart after God. I'm going to get to the parable of the sower in a minute. I jumped the gun. Thy words have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In 1 Timothy 4.15, Paul commands Timothy to meditate on things that, on, on these things. The word meditate in this, in this um, chapter, Timothy, when, when Paul is speaking to him, Paul told Timothy to meditate, and that word in that instance means to attend to or to practice, to live it, okay? Not just be a, a heart or a person of um, telling, but a person who is living the life. So he's telling him to attend to these things, to practice these things, to be diligent in these things. He was reminding Timothy to be an example in life, in word, lifestyle, love, in the spirit, in faith, and in purity, and not to neglect the gift of the Holy Spirit. But he said to Timothy, meditate on these things. So we know that meditation is an action. It's an action of being still with God and, and meditating on his word. And in this instance, meditate means to live the life, not just be, a, a, you know, not just to speak it, but to do it. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, it says, Out of the heart the mouth speaks. And... Um, may I just turn to that? Luke chapter 6, verse 45. I want to see if that's the scripture I want or the next one. Okay, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 and 37. Uh, 34 through 37. Again, Jesus is speaking, O generation of vipers, how can, how can ye be evil? Speak good things, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The next verse, please. A good man out of good treasure of heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of evil treasure bring forth good thing, uh, evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, 
they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. And this goes back, if you remember the, the Psalm 19, where David is saying, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. That's what we're talking about tonight, okay? We're talking about our lifestyle. We're talking about our heart being acceptable before God. In Proverbs 4.23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, Jesus has something to say to us. This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. This scripture was from Isaiah, and Jesus was speaking it. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus felt very strongly about having a right heart towards God. In this passage, he berates the Pharisees regarding the law and their hypocrisy. Again, noted in Mark 7, 9, and Matthew 15, 8, and 9. It says, you praise me with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. In this instance, the Pharisees had come to Jesus and were... Um, were asking him why his disciples were eating with unwashed hands. They were men that spoke with their mouth, but their lives were not, their hearts were not acceptable. Their hearts were not right with God. Their hearts were far from him. Now the parable of the sower, because, why did God want me to read this tonight? Because, as you know, the parable is talking about the heart. So as we examine ourselves tonight, think, what kind of a heart do I have? Don't deceive yourself. If we're not, nobody's perfect, nobody's arrived, we are saved and we are forgiven. But we need to examine ourselves that we don't fall away. So in the parable of the sower, again, it's in Matthew, it's in Mark, and it's in Luke. Um, I believe I used Mark 4. Let me go to Mark. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. Now this is Jesus again teaching. And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into the ship and sat in the sea. The whole multitude was by the sea on the land, and he taught them many things by parables and unto them in his doctrine. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, because it had no root, and it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And, on, and, a, and other fell on good ground, and it did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears, let him hear. As he says to us tonight, Holy Spirit is talking to us tonight. You have ears, let you hear. Now again, when he was alone, 
they asked him, his disciples asked him, you know, what does it mean? The seed is the word of God. And those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. So this makes me think this is the unbeliever. You know, they might come, hear the word, and then they go off and do their own thing, and they're not, they're not, um, they haven't really received it. It's snatched away. They're a distracted person. You know, they're not ready. And the second instance, they lack root. They are on the rock. Oh, they, they on the rock are they which when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, shallow, no depth to them, which while believe and in time of temptation fall away. Remember David's prayer for help. Don't, you know, he can't, he doesn't want to be, have the devil to have dominion over him. So in this instance, these are superficial. These are people with, who lack root. The word comes to them, and it's wonderful on Sunday, and they walk out the door, and they just keep on doing what they're doing. Something, you know, something comes right to take away the word, and they just get, they just fall away. Temptation, they forget all about God. Now, number three, the third example, they which fell among thorns, God this might be people in the church. This might be people. Because it says, which have heard, they which fell among the thorns, are they which have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. And we can be guilty of that. We can get busy. We can be overwhelmed. We can be distracted. We receive the word, we've heard it, we, you know, we love to hear the word of God, but something comes along in it, and it's like, you know, we just get distracted, and, and we lose out. Now, I want you to notice that it doesn't say that they don't have any fruit, but it says... The word is choked with cares and riches and the pleasures of this life, and they bring forth no fruit to perfection. So they might have, you know, some fruit, but it's not perfection. It's not where God wants you to be. And finally, that's where the scripture, faith without works is dead. You know, you can come and you can believe and you can, Take it home, and but if you don't have works, if you don't have that, your fruit isn't going to come to perfection. The word cautions, the word cautions, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This is where I'm asking you to examine yourself tonight. This is where I'm examining myself tonight. Where is my heart? Is my heart, is the meditation of my heart and the words of my lips acceptable to our God? In 1 John 2.15, it says, Love not the world, nor the things of the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Guard your heart. I wrote, I'm sorry to believe this probably refers to many in God's house, even some here. We say, Lord, we love you. Wednesday and Sunday we gather together. We come to the altar. We may even gather together at somebody's house. We, we, are, we think we're all set. We're, 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 we're at risk. If we just think we've arrived and we don't have to guard our hearts, guard our minds, we're at risk, okay? We need to be diligent. 
But how do we live Monday through Saturday? What time, attention, and thought do we sacrifice for the cares, riches, and pleasures of God? Okay, God says, bring his tithe into the storehouse, right? Tithe, do we tithe? Tithing is our first fruit. How much of our time, our talent, and our treasure do we give to God? Or is it just lip service on Monday, uh, Sunday and Wednesday? We might have some fruit, but it's not coming to perfection. We have witnessed so many people. Is something in our lives not, not reflecting Jesus that could be better, that people will come to him? The seed which falls on good ground are people of honest and good heart. Having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Hallelujah. Again, when we're right with God, we have an honest and good heart before him. We're not deceiving ourselves. We're not perfect. But we're, we're humble, honest as the psalmist, not perfect, just open and humble before God, a soft heart pliable in his hands. This word is not to condemn anyone. This word applies to the speaker as well as the hearer. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it says the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God or woman may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's the word of God tonight. That's what we have come to hear, what God has wanted us to do. Let's return to the last verse in Psalm 19 one more time. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. This is the prayer of the psalmist, and this is my prayer tonight. As we close in prayer, let's lift our hearts before God. Father, we pray this, this psalm to you. We pray that you will search our hearts. Holy Spirit, Illuminate the dark places, the forgotten, the neglected spaces of our heart, occupied by anything other than you. If we fall into this category of the unfertile ground, convict our hearts today, Lord. We must not continue in blindness or unforgiveness or a wicked, unbelieving heart. Your word says if we repent our sins, omission or commission, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As the psalmist closed his prayer, you truly are, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Thank you.